This is the Not So Secret Lives of Authors. Um, I'm Simon Wood and I am your um, moderator or MC because this is a little different from the usual um, panel. This is something I've done at Left Coast a few times. Or I don't think I've ever done it at Bouchicon. Um, rather than we have questions and the panelists answer it, what we've actually got are stories. The usual question that pops up is, uh, where do you get your ideas from? Well, it's from the lives the authors have led. It's the things they've done, and most times it's the things they shouldn't have done um, that shapes who they are and the kind of things they write. So what we're going to do is everybody is going to tell a true story. It may be a little bit weird, a little bit awkward, but hopefully you'll see how it usually goes into their storytelling and their books. Um, so everybody's going to take their turn. I'm going to start because I've got some people who've never done this before with me today. Um, so I want to give them a feel for what we kind of do. I do have small introductions for everybody's story to get your prime. But I'm going to start with mine, which is the, uh, the time that I became a smuggler. <laughs> um, so I had a friend who um, move, moved and relocated back to the US in the mid 90s. So um, I came to visit him and, um, and of course family said, can you take something with you? And I said, yeah, sure, fine, I can do that. Um, and so his mother-in-law brought a bag and she goes, it's baby clothes. And it's, you know, it's a, you know, it's a full size holder and it weighed about 40 pounds. <laughs> but being slightly naive, I kind of went, oh, sure, fine. Um, and so I did not look in the bag. It was in my, it was in my uh, hallway for a few days and I basically finally got, I thought, I, sh I know they're going to ask me, did you pack your bags? And I'm going to say, oh, I'll, I'll have a quick look. And there was, it was just baby clothes on the top. So I went, oh, fine, I can answer that question um, with all good conscience. Um, so I took this flight. It was going to Houston from London. And so I had no problems with it. Um, and then one of those awkward things, Houston is not my final destination, but you've got to go through customs at that point. And a few things went wrong. One, I did not realize first time traveling to the US, you have to fill out that declaration thing. Are you, have you ever been a Nazi? Have you been a member of the Communist Party? But the big question was, um, where are you going to stay? And I went, I don't know. A friend's house wasn't going to really cut it. So um, I knew one street address in Tulsa. Uh, or I knew one street name. And I thought, I've seen enough Starsky and Hush to know. There's usually four numbers for a house number. So I completely made up an address. And I thought, that'll work, I hope. So I, I, I must admit, I was kind of bricking it as I was like going towards it. I thought, all these security guys, they're going to know every address in America. Um, so that was nerve wracking, but I had to go and collect my bags off the carousel. So I'm pulling the bags off and I had to pick up this bag from the mother-in-law. And as I picked it up, it's so heavy. I actually fell over and I was being dragged along. <laughs> so that started to draw attention. Um, so I finally get it off and a beagle runs up to me and starts sniffing around me. I cuddle the beagle and said, has anyone lost a dog? Next thing I know, it's um, the security lady with a gun saying, leave the <laughs> dog alone. <laughs> and so I'm going, oh, I said, because it didn't have a little jacket or anything. It was just a beagle um, running around. So I, I kind of let the dog alone. And they sort of like went, he's a complete idiot. Let him go. So then I basically stood in line with my bit of paper with my lying address on it. <laughs> and the... Um, they, I, I start to sweat a lot because I'm thinking that they're going to know the address is fake. They're going to know the address is fake. And I basically go through and the guy just looked at the card and put it down and said, you're, you're fine. You're on your way. So I actually um, just went, okay. And I walked through and went, I went, this is brilliant. This is fine. And so I was quite happy until we got home to the, um, to my friend's house. When we opened up and took the baby clothes off, there's a full size box of rich tea biscuits or cookies. Underneath that is 20 pounds of bacon that's frozen. <laughs> um, underneath that is a big bottle of um, like Costco kind of uh, HP sauce. 
and it has burst. Oh. The whole of the bag is full of like steak sauce. And now I understand why the beagle was interested. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so we basically called uh, the mother-in-law like one in the morning, sort of London time, and said, "What the hell? This he could have gone to jail with all this stuff in the bag." And she goes, "Well, I thought if I didn't tell him, he wouldn't he wouldn't look so guilty going through." So that was the adventure with that. But that put me on a watch list for about two years. And I think it was the fake address because I came into Houston about a year later, uh, going to Costa Rica and I, and it didn't twig with me what had happened. Mm. I basically ran through the, um, you, you had like the short connect from Houston, get a plane then go off to Costa Rica. And, um, I was running down the concourse to get my connecting flight and a secure, uh, you know, a TSA lady just came out and stopped me and said, Mr. Wood, do you have, do you have a second? And I said, well, I've got a flight. And she goes, um, no, can, can you just stop a sec? And she emptied my, my luggage out onto the concourse and said, uh, you were here a year ago. And I went, yeah. And she goes, what were you doing? And I, <laughs> and I said, I'm just, I was just traveling. And she goes, what are you doing now? I said, I'm off to Costa Rica. My plane's just over there. It's going to leave. In it. And she goes, oh, that's interesting. And she, said, she just quizzed me. And then she just said, okay, thanks. And left all my stuff over the concourse. And I had to like stuff it all into the, the bag. And I sort of ran off. And then I realized it was the fact that she called me by name. We weren't in a security line. We just, oh, yeah. And it was just that she kind of popped out and went, hey. Um, but that kind of carried on. I was flew into St. Louis once and I was standing, I always have colorful um, luggage. So if someone tries to run off with it, I'll, I'll know who it is. And I, every time I stopped at the airport and St. Louis was one where you suddenly saw uh, a TSA person pick up your luggage and walk off with it. And you're like going, Oh, I'm going into a room for 10 minutes. And it was usually just the same questions. It'd be like, you, you were here some time ago. What did you do? And it'd just be these sort of like, questions that weren't particularly direct or pointed at anything and then they would just let me go and they went on for about two years until i got married and then it all went away hmm. but that's the time that i actually became a smuggler and um you know got on a tsa watch list for a bit wow how come the bacon didn't go off yeah <laughs> that's i was i was really stunned at that it was still yeah. cold but it was wow. great bacon there's a big difference it's, you know, it's proper bacon. It's none of this oh, yeah. crap. Oh, yeah. Right. Mm. And it was like, so, you know, it's worth its weight in gold. Yeah. Mm. It's got a decent street value, I'll tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. So I'm going to move on to uh, Katrina McPherson. She was born in Scotland and has lived, uh, and lived there until she emigrated to the U.S. in 2010. She writes the multi-award winning Dandy Gilver series set in the old country in the 1930s. I assume the old country is Greece. As well as the uh, strand of multi-award winning um, psychological thrillers, uh, after eight years in the new country, she's kicked off a humorous, uh, la the Humorous Last Ditch series, which takes a wry look at California life. Uh, these are not multi-award winning. But the first, uh, the first two won the, the same award in consecutive years, which doesn't suck. Katrina is a proud <laughs> lifetime member and a former president of Sisters in Crime. Uh, Katrina's story is unintentional public nudity, New York City edition. Chapter four. I just realised I haven't got, I'm about to come without my Sisters in Crime badge on, but I am not going to go away and get it. Um, yes, yeah, so this is, this is chapter four of Unintentional Public Nudity. Chapters one to three were at Left Coast Crime at this event with Simon. And it's all completely true. Although this time, it's more like I was trying for public nudity and I failed. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, this story takes place in 2015. Um, when I had a broken arm, I fell down walking to the mailbox. I could have stayed hunched over my computer, I would have been fine, but I was stupid and I took exercise and I walked to the mailbox and I went down 
And as I went down, I was thinking, I'm still going to the Edgars, because I was nominated for a Mary Higgins Clark Award. So I was trying to get ready to go. Oh, New York, it's so glam, you know, that hotel in 42nd Street, you know, above Grand Central Station. It's just so fantastic. And I got a bubblegum pink halter neck dress with a big gold zip and matching bubblegum pink patent winkle picker ankle strap shoes because my motto is far too much is almost enough right so I was trying this on before I went to New York showing my husband Neil and said it's quite hard to get dressed when you've got only one arm and especially when you don't want to snag your 100% polyester brand new dress so I didn't have a brown and I said to Neil you obviously I'll I'll you know what does this look like obviously I'll wear a bra and because we've been married for 180 years and he's getting good at it, he said, you don't need a bra, darling. I went, aye, aye, okay, whatever. Fine, check, you've done it. But here's the thing. When I got to New York and I had a shower, you know, one-armed, which is really difficult, and I did my hair one-armed, which is really difficult, and even my face was difficult enough at the best of times. Um, and I started to try and get dressed and I had no bra. My strapless bra was not in my case. So I phoned Neil and said, what the hell's going on? And he said, I told you, you, you don't need one. I said, wait, 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 wait. That was cute. But you do not have clearance for that kind of decision. You can't make wardrobe decisions. Who, who do you think you are? What am I going to do? There's going to be big, important grown up people here tonight. So I thought, right, thankfully, I'm in Manhattan, right, where you can get anything. And it's all just outside the door. It's the home of the $4 banana, but as long as you're willing to pay, it's just outside the door. So I went out um, in, I think, sweats or something really easy to put on and thought, where will I go? Where will I go? Um, I think Lord and Taylor, big department store, is just a few blocks down that way. And I've got half an hour. So off I went, trying not to sweat, which is not a thing, right? Trying not to sweat. That's nonsense. But I was doing it anyway. Trying not to let my hair go flat which is also not a thing. But off I went, scurried to Lord and Taylor, up to the lingerie department and thought, thank God I'm in New York and grabbed this woman and said, here's the thing. I've got a black tie event in 20 minutes now. I've only got one arm. I haven't got the strapless bra I need to wear under my dress. So could you get me three different sizes of your any way, you know, halter over the shoulder or strapless bras, take the straps off them, meet me in the changing room, help me try them on. And when one fits, rip the ticket off and then ring it up and then I'll go wearing it. And she said, bras? That's what she said. It was like, and I thought, yeah, bras, strapless bras, half an hour, black tie event, one arm, take them off, help me, ring it up. And she said, most of our special, I'm not going to do the accent because it's offensive. Most of our speciality bras are over here. And she started walking towards them. And once upon a time, I stayed in a small hotel in a small town in the south of France. And the guy checked us in and he walked us to our room. And he was so laid back because it was south of France that even though we were following him, we kept getting in front of him because he was walking so slow. But he looked like he was hustling compared with this shop assistant in Lord and Taylor in Manhattan. So I was ambling towards these for 15 minutes now, ambling towards these brass and thought, I'm not even going to try. I'll just buy three. I'll find three, like round about the right side. I'll buy them and I'll bring two back tomorrow. So she went off. I found three bras, picked them, picked the colour, picked them up with my one arm, still beat her back to the till. And I'm standing there waiting for her to come back. She came back and I said, I'm going to buy all three and I'll bring two back tomorrow. OK. And she said, sure. And I put them on the counter and she said, guess what she said? Do you have a Lord and Taylor card? And I said, no, I don't. I don't. I've got a black tie event in 11 minutes and one arm and a dress that I need one of these bras for. No, I don't. And she said then, guess what? Would you like to open a Lord and Taylor? <laughs> said, no, no, no. I would like to pay with this credit card that I am holding up in your face so hard that I'm going to snap it. Right. So she put it through and gave me the receipt. And then she took one bra and turned away and put it on a pile of tissue paper and scratched up three pieces of the tissue paper to wrap this one bra. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm going to be rude now, but I'm just going to take these three bras and I'm going to put this 
put them in this bag and I've got the receipt and I'm leaving. I'll see you tomorrow and I'll say sorry properly then, okay? And she said nothing because she hadn't processed the sentence by the time I'd got to the end of it. She was still, it was still working through her brain. How did she have a job in New York is what I want to know. Anyway, so there I was with seven minutes to go before I've got to be at the reception, powering back along the blocks towards the hotel, trying not to sweat, which isn't a thing, trying not to let my hair go flat, which isn't a thing, trying to not let my feet get dirty on New York's dusty pavements, which isn't a thing. But I come into the foyer of the, um, what's it called? The Grand Central Hotel, the Hyatt at Grand Central. I come into the foyer and I'm powering across the foyer, sweating like a pig. Hair looked like it's dyed on my head, like seaweed on a rock, filthy feet, no time to fix any of it. And who should I happen to run into but Claire O'Donoghue? Now, I'm sure some people here know Claire O'Donoghue, right? And she said, are you okay? And I said, no, I'm not. And she said, can I help? And I said, yes, come up to my room with me, take these three bras, take all the straps off, help me try them on. If one fits, can you take the ticket off and then pull my zip up? And Claire said, absolutely, because she is from Chicago. That's my story. That's my story. Oh, my God. Very, 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 very frustrating. So I'm going to be moving on up from bras to Gary Phillips. I don't have a good segue. I can't do a good segue for that. Um, so Gary Phillips has published various novels, comics, short stories, and edited or co-edited various anthologies, including the Anthony Award winning uh, Obama Inheritance, 15 Stories of Conspiracy Noir. Violent Springs, published 26 years ago, was recently named one of the essential crime novels of LA. He, he was also the, the story editor of Snowfall, an, ex, uh, an FX show about crack and the CIA in 1980s uh, cent, uh, South Central LA, where he grew up. Um, Phillips' latest novel is Matthew Henson and the Ice Temple of Harlem. Gary, t unmute yourself and tell us a story about gunplay, but without injury. <laughs> so this story uh, takes place some years ago uh, and, 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 and one of the uh, details of the story, which you'll, you'll see why it's important a little later, uh, is that I was young and, and uh, agile uh, in those days. Uh, and I had been uh, away to college and then I came back home, you know, for the summer, right? I came back to South Central where I grew up and, and, and where I, at the time I was, uh, my dad, was alive then. It was so it was me and my dad and and uh, just as a side note, my dad and I kind of lived like uh, a little bit like Sanford and Son. For those of you who are old enough to remember that show, uh, where uh, my you know my dad was a mechanic, so we always had parts of cars around the house and and cars in various stages. In those days, cars in various stages of being uh, cannibalized one for one for the other, because in those days you had carburetors and you could do that, but you can't you can't really do that now. Anyway, all that to say is that I came back home. And uh, of course, I, I saw you know come back to see some of your uh, friends who were either back from college or 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 they're you know just there in the summer. And um, also important detail, which will also you'll see a little later. Uh, these are guys I played football with in uh, in high school. So so me and a couple of my buddies, uh, uh, actually a guy named France, his actual last name is France, and uh, and Wayne, a couple other guys, we go to a party as you do when you're a young, or not so young, but young man. But I was going to say, I guess I was in my late teens. Or maybe, maybe I might have even been in my early, I might have been 20 at that point. I'm not quite sure. That part's vague. The part that I was crystal clear is coming up. So we go to this party, and it's lovely. You know, it's a little house party, and music is playing and this and that. But as these things happen, particularly in those days, not so much even now, I guess, but certainly in those days, when the, uh, this is when the Crips and the Bloods had come on the scene, I mean, they had been on the scene for several years, then, but they were particularly strong and, and sort of uh, vibrant in those days in the, in the, uh, in the late 70s in, uh, in parts of the neighborhood. So a couple of these young gentlemen come up to the door and they, they want uh, entry into the party. And they are denied entry because they are not dressed properly, nor uh, are they, are they uh, wanted. Uh, but uh, as that happens, they, they go away and they come back. And sure enough, they start shooting into the party. 
And, uh, and I find this out later. Uh, turns out one of the guys in the party happened to have his gun with him in a shoulder holster, in a shoulder rig, and he brought it out, and he was returning fire. So this is why they, they never kind of gained entry. But, and this is the other part that's really important, and this is the other part sort of to Simon's point about how this plays a role in your writing. It is absolutely true. This is the first time I was ever shot at. I've subsequently first time. I, first time. But but it is absolutely true that under, you know, as your adrenaline is pumping and you know, fear and 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 flight or flight and all that stuff was happening to you, in fact, it things slow down. Because really, you know, if you were an observer watching this uh take place on the outside, you would it it it, it, it couldn't have happened for more than Two minutes, maybe, maybe two minutes maximum, you know, in terms of them shooting in, return fire, and then them, them essentially running off, driving off, and going away. But when you're inside of it, and, and you can't see bullets, but you can hear the bullets coming through the stucco, and, you know, and glass pane getting blown out from, 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 from a blast from, from a handgun, it's, it's really weirdly slow. It's, it's, you, everything is very acute. Everything is very minute, and everything is very much clearer and there's a lot of clarity. But he, and here's the humorous part of our story. The other good part is that nobody got nobody got nobody got killed. So nobody that, that's a good that's the good part of the story. The good part of the story is nobody got killed. But as I'm as the bullets are coming in and I'm in the front room, right? But you know there's people in other parts of the house too, you know. But as the bullets are coming in and the music is still playing and I remember it's the shy lights. I, I remember that distinctly the music is still playing. Um People, some people are panicking, right? So they're, they're huddled together on the couch as if, by the way, huddled together is a good idea when you're getting shot at, which is not a good idea. And they're, but I'm, I'm facing them. So they're huddled on the couch and I'm sort of, my back, so my back is actually to the window where the bullets are coming in. And because I, you know, I'm a good sized fellow, they're grabbing me by the lapels and using me as a human shield. <laughs> so, so at that moment, Absolute clarity spawned in my brain and said, oh, Gary, this is not good. You should get out of this particular position you're in now. This actually might be a problem. Because <laughs> I, I was on my way to getting out of the room. I was on my way to, to safety or relative safety. But I thought, oh, you know, this is really, this is really not good. And now, now, backing up, right? So, again, everything is slowed down. I was young and agile then. And I was a, I was a former high school a, a football player. So I remember the, the move my coach had taught me because, you know, uh, uh, actually one of the guys that was, was at the party, we were kind of, he was an a, a end and I was a, a defensive tackle. And, and at one point, because we were pretty big guys, we were pretty proficient in what we did, uh, they had to split us up. In other words, you know, we were on one side of the line and then they split us up because when we played certain schools, they wouldn't run to us because we were always very good at tackling, you know, either tackling the runner or getting to the quarterback. And so they would do what they call a trap play on you, which is, which is to say the, the, the offensive attacker would, would hold you up and the guard would come down the line and, and chop me in, in the knees. And that was a, you know, sort of like a way to double team you. But there was a technique, you, what they call the rollout, to get out of that. So at that particular moment, as people are grabbing me and using me as a human shield and the bullets are you know, coming past, and you can hear the bullets coming, you know, at least striking the wall past you, I remember that particular technique. I rolled out got away from those, got off those people off the, huddled on the couch and ran somewhere toward the back of the house. And by then I think the shooting, the shooting had stopped. My buddy, one of my buddies had run up under the bed and another buddy, a buddy of mine was huddled with a couple of women because he was always good with women. So he was kind of with a couple of women protecting them or, you know, pretending to protect them. But so, so the lesson was, and so as I said, so nobody got hurt, but, but the lesson was, uh, I don't know if there was any lesson uh, other than, you know, you can, you can never tell when you're going to get shot at. Uh, but you got to keep a clear head uh, and the fact that it is absolutely true, as, you, as we've read in various thrillers, and I think some of us have put those in various, various uh, parts of our books, it is, it is absolutely true, at least from my experience, that when, when sort of this violence is escalated or when this kind of uh, extra normal thing happens, in fact, it doesn't happen quick. It happens very slow. The time for you really slows down. And, that, and you could see, I guess, I, guess, I guess it taught me that you could see that like, like in combat or certain other situations where I guess on one hand, things are very, obviously things are very accelerated, but as they slow down, you, there are certain choices you can make that there are, I guess, just microseconds or milliseconds in your head, but that could, you know, set the course. 
for uh, what's to come later. So, so there you go. That's great. Yeah, I, I have to agree with that. I think I'm not sure if, if time slows down or it's that um, you're just processing every frame. Of yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so sort of like uh, you get time to examine it, even though it right. happens in a in a in a split second. In a flash, exactly, exactly. Yeah. But, but it seems. But you're, I agree. So I mean, it's, it's, it's like every frame is 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 static. And, and you have this immense clarity about, oh, I should go this way, I should this way, or I could do this, or I could do that, yeah. You know that in the chat panel, people are writing a story that incorporates all our stories. Are you serious? <laughs> that's right, exactly. So smuggled bacon in a bra and that's, a rollout it, so it. far. That's it. Let's see so, how mine, mine will. Choosing their own adventures. Well, we've got two more stories. <laughs> We're going to see how this 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 novel's going to shake out then. <laughs> um, I'm going to move on to William Kent Kruger. He's the author of the New York Times best-selling uh, Cork O'Connor mystery series set in the great north woods of Minnesota. His work has received an Edgar, a McCavity, and multiple Antonys, uh, Barry, and a Dillies uh, Award, and a um, Friends of the American Writers Prize. Uh, he has also been translated into more than 20 languages. He lives in St. Paul and does all his creative writing in his local friendly author coffee shop, which we just found out doesn't, doesn't happen anymore. This is old news, you sent me. <laughs> um, his most recent uh, novel, This Tender Land, has spent several months on the New York Times bestsellers list. Um, Kent's story is the story of the novel I don't remember writing. Kent, take it away. Sure, thanks very much, Simon. Uh, you know, I have been uh, publishing mysteries now for more than 20 years. And um, and when, you know, I've had a book come out basically almost every year. That's commercial speed for us all. Um, and every time I have a new book come out, I typically will go on a fairly significant book tour across the country. And when I do my signings after I've, um, made my presentation to the folks there and opened it up to questions. I get, one of the questions I always get, I'm sure is the same one that all the panelists get, which goes something like, can you tell us where the, the idea for the book came from? And, uh, and how did you come up with the elements that you used in creating the mystery? And I, I really like that question because you know, it's a pretty easy one to answer. Um, well, pretty easy except for one novel, a uh, novel called Trickster's Point, kind of midway in my series. And whenever, uh, readers have asked me about that book, where it came from, where the elements came from. I just have to shrug and say, I don't remember. <laughs> and, you know, to this day, I don't remember writing most of that story. And it's huh. not because I'm uh, approaching 70 years old and standing on the door to step to, uh, to senility. Um, here's the story. Uh, my wife is from Omaha, Nebraska. We live in St. Paul. Every um, Memorial Day for several decades, we have traveled down to Omaha that weekend to spend with my wife's family. And usually while we're there on, on Saturday or Sunday, we'll go out and visit all of the cemeteries in Omaha or in the small towns around Omaha where my wife's relatives have been buried. Uh, we'll put flowers on the graves and then spend a few minutes and I love listening to the stories that my wife's family tell about all of these people they remember who are now gone. I had, you know, that wasn't a tradition growing up in my family, but I have come to really cherish uh, this tradition in my wife's family. So a few years ago, when I was about two thirds of the way through the writing of the manuscript for Trickster's Point, Memorial Day rolled around and we headed down to Omaha. That Saturday, we visited all of the cemeteries, we did the flowers, we shared our stories. And that night, we, my wife and I had dinner with some old friends of ours, which is the last thing I remember before waking up the next day, lying in a hospital bed. My wife is at bedside along with her brother and they are both laughing uproariously at me. I was confused to say the least, and I was a little miffed. Uh, and then my wife proceeded to explain to me what had occurred. Apparently, because I remember none of this, apparently that morning when we were getting dressed at the hotel, 
Uh, I turned to my wife and I said, Diane, I'm having some trouble here. I think I've lost something. Where are we? Hmm. She said, we're in Omaha. And I said, okay, okay. And, um, and when did we arrive? And she said, yesterday. Okay. And how did we get here? <laughs> okay, okay, thanks, thanks. Five minutes later, I turned to her and I said, Diane, I think I've lost something. Where are we? How long have we been here? How did we get here? And when I had asked those questions of her three or four times, finally dawned on her there was something not right going on. Uh, actually, she thought I was having a stroke. We were, the, the hotel was just a quarter of a mile from the nearest hospital. So she whisked me away in the car to the emergency room. Uh, they did a uh, CAT scan and they did an MRI and they could find nothing wrong with me. Um, but a few minutes later, after they had finished these tests, the brain specialist who was on call showed up and according to my wife, uh, proceeded to question us both uh, about hmm. what was going on. And at the end of our conversation, he said, okay, I know what's going on. It's something I don't see very often, but I know what's going on. It's called transient global amnesia. And he explained that it's a situation where an individual for a brief period of time, usually no more than 24 hours, loses completely the ability to form new memories. Yeah. So um, every time my wife gave me a piece of information, it went right out of my head. He said it will last uh, only at most 24 hours it will not be life-threatening. Uh, the only thing that may result from it is he may have some blank periods in his memory leading up to the episode. Hmm. Now, according to my wife, I was completely cogent during all of this and responding to questions uh, as well as I could. So for example, uh, before they wheeled me out to the CAT scan, uh, one of the nurses asked me, uh, Mr. Kruger, how tall are you? I told her I was five feet up. <laughs> I, I'm five feet nine inches tall. I have always aspired to be. Young, 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 to a Simon. Cool. I'm a little taller than that guy. Uh, and the nurse asked me then, okay, Mr. Kruger, and how much do you weigh? And I said, 165 pounds. Well, yeah, 40 years ago. <laughs> and then apparently before they, they wheeled me out for the CAT scan, I said to the nurse, there's one more important thing you need to know about me. I'm a world famous author. <laughs> apparently, I turned to my wife and I said, I am a world famous author, aren't I? <laughs> to which my lovely wife replied, not as famous as you think, dear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, now um, one of the things about transient global amnesia is they have no idea what causes it because it's over too quickly. They can't really study it, but they do know there are certain triggers. And one of the triggers for transient global amnesia is a significant traumatic emotional experience. So one of the questions the brain specialist asked my wife was, has your husband, well, actually he asked me first, have you experienced any, any emotional trauma lately? To which I replied, according to my wife, no. And then my wife said, well, that's not true. His father died two weeks ago. Hmm. And I looked at hmm. my wife and I said, dad's dead? Hmm. <laughs> and then, because we went through this process with the same set of questions four or five more times with different people uh -huh. at the hospital, every time that, uh, that my wife was asked about an emotional trauma, and she said, yes, his father passed away two weeks ago, hmm. I would look at her and go, Dad's dead? Oh, man. Now, uh, despite the fact that the, uh, the brain specialist said this is a fairly rare occurrence, when I posted this story uh, on my Facebook blog, um, I got a flood of responses from people saying, you know, the same thing happened to me, or the same thing happened to my uncle, or it happened to my aunt twice. But maybe the most comforting of all of the emails I got was one that came from a guy that went something like this. Dear Mr. Kruger, you're lucky your wife was with you when you experienced your episode. When I experienced mine, I was alone. And when I finally came out of it, I was in my neighbor's backyard in my underwear. Wow. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so one of the things that the, 
that the brain specialist said has certainly proven true. He said, I would have some gaps in my memory of things leading up to that episode. And for the life of me, I cannot recall writing this trickster, writing Trickster's Point. Two thirds of Trickster's Point is a mystery to me. Um, and so, um, so listen, if any of you out there, if we ever have a chance to have a conversation in person and you have some burning question that you want to ask me about Trickster's Point, don't. <laughs> Because you'd be wasting <laughs> Back to you, Simon. Um, I, I, as, as some people know, I collect concussions and traumatic brain injuries as a hobby. And um, I got hit by a car riding my bike a few years ago. And I, I suffered from, uh, I still suffer from long term. I, I have short term memory loss um, uh, on a daily basis. I, I'm basically in the same crowd as boxers and football players. Uh, but one thing I did have from that is I, I remember bits of the accident, but it's that I don't remember two weeks after. Mm. I have about six months of empty space, but one thing I did do is I did that thing that I could not form a memory for about two weeks. If you, it, I did the thing of um, saying, asking where the dog was, walking out the room, walking back in going, uh, where is the dog? Then walking back out the room, walking back in going, where's the dog? Uh, and it's a very weird experience because it's very much like the film Memento and you can feel a memory slip away is that I usually have people, I'll be rude and say, shut up. You have to stop talking or I'm actually going to lose the moment and I'm not going to remember anything. It's a very curious thing, um, how the brain does or doesn't work. So have you used it, Kent? What? The... <laughs> Don't no, mess with me. <laughs> no, have you used the transient <laughs> global amnesia? You know, in, it's in a story. A as, a, as a good cop out for committing a murder and not remembering it. But I think that's been used before too. Right. Uh, so no, yeah. I haven't yet used it in any, any of my stories. Yeah, you'd have to use it, but not, but not let it cash out too neatly for yourself. Because even though it's true, it's going to feel like cheating, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to collaborate on this one? <laughs> oh, I think probably they're at they're on it on the sideline uh, on the, yeah, the sidebar already. Yeah. No, I'm, a, I'm actually writing something on on having the memory loss because um, I had the thing of um, my wife and friends tried to fill in the gap mm. for me, and it's that thing of there's a thing called manufactured memory, and it's a oh. that's just as disconcerting you start to believe things based on um, what right. tell, people yeah. tell you. Yeah. And that is just as disconcerting. So it's about someone who believes they've done a terrible thing, but what the real truth is they've done a much worse mm. thing. And it'll all come out. But, um, so moving on to Ellen, our last storyteller. Uh, Ellen's Cajun Country Mysteries has won the Agatha Best Contemporary novel and multiple lefties for best humorous novel. Um, her new catering hall mystery series written as uh, Maria Dorico launched with Here Comes the Body and was inspired by her real life. Ellen is a award-winning playwright, a non-award-winning TV writer of comedies like Wings, Just Shoot Me, Fairly and Fairly Odd Parents. She has written over 200 articles for national magazines but considers her most impressive credit working as a cater waiter for, for Martha Stewart. Ellen's story is about a long haul flight into tragedy. <laughs> well, um, okay, so uh, I uh, was teaching a workshop in Auckland, New Zealand, and I got a really cheap, this was in 1990, and I got a really cheap flight, but to get there, I had to fly to Sydney and then fly back to Auckland, which is kind of the equivalent of going to Chicago by way of Los Angeles. Mm. So I was living in New York at the time, so I flew from New York to LA, LA to Honolulu to pick up the flight to Sydney. And, um, oh, and I was leaving on uh, January 11th and arriving on January 13th, and my birthday is January 12th. So I was missing my birthday, crossing the date line, which of course makes me a year younger. So anyway, I get on the flight. It's a late flight. I think it's like midnight. And um, I'm sitting next to a man. Uh, he was an Italian immigrant to uh, Sydney with his family and they'd been traveling. They'd been in Connecticut um, to, for his father-in-law who was 80, who had just turned 80 to meet relatives he hadn't seen since he was five. 
So um, my Italian, my mother is Italian, and um, even though Italian was language they spoke when they didn't want us to understand what she was taught, saying about us, I had learned some, and my Italian was pretty good at the time, so I was talking to him a little, and um, so we take off. And, you know, and so he's going a little back and forth to see his family, which is they're seated in another part of the plane. And so about two hours out of Honolulu, he comes up to me and goes, Morta, Morta. And I'm like, what? Morta, Morta, si, Morta. His father-in-law had died on the flight. So I, at that point, I had been uh, chatting with the crew before I got on saying, hey, it's my birthday. Maybe you can sneak me a little something for first class, you know, champagne or something. So I became the, um, the go-between. I'm suddenly, I go, okay, okay. So I go to the crew and say, you know, this gentleman next to me says his father-in-law has died. And the crew is like, hmm. So you hear <laughs> over the intercom, you hear, is there a doctor on the flight? And it was like one of those big planes back then. So um, there was not a doctor, but there was a medical student who did indeed verify that this man had passed away. And so uh, I suddenly become, because I'm suddenly this family is speaking Italian again, I suddenly become the go-between between the crew and this family that has just lost their loved one mid-flight. So, um, so we're trying to figure out what to do. And, you know, they're like, well, what's, the, where are they going? And I'm like, Sydney. And so the pilot, you know, is like, okay. And the flight attendant is like, well, we were going to stop. The pilot was thinking maybe we should stop in Fiji. But if Sydney is their final destination, no pun intended, um, perhaps we should just keep going. And I'm like, good idea. So what they did is they, now, meanwhile, this is like the middle of the night. It's like two in the morning. And by the way, I've been up since New York. <laughs> so they emptied the back very last row of the plane. Somehow they found places for these people. They laid him out with a blanket up to his neck and they seat belted an M. And I'm like, he said, well, they said, well, we don't want to worry the plane. We want people to think he's just sleeping. So I'm like, okay. So for the next eight hours, we fly, because it's oh, we're only two hours out of Honolulu. It's another eight hours to Sydney. We fly <laughs> with a dead man strapped into <clears throat> the last row, made to look like he was sleeping. And I'd met other people because the flight had been delayed a little. So I knew people at different parts of the plane. And very people did not know this man was dead. I did. I'd walk by to go to the bathroom, look down, and, and there's a, a, a dead man lying there. So I'm like, and I've been up for hours so and then i said when i'm not dealing with the crew i'm dealing with a rotating cast of family members because they were all taking turns turns comforting the now widow um so they'd i'd be sitting there talking to the you know some sobbing member because it was um the the older couple the the this husband and wife, and then their two teenage kids. So for the next eight hours, um, until we landed in Sydney, you know, I was like either going talking to the crew or talking to the family and in Italian and in English. So we finally landed in Sydney. I'm like, oh my God, just get me to Auckland, get me to Auckland. Well, guess what? When someone dies on a plane, they impound the plane because they don't know, it, it, clearly this man died of natural causes, but they don't know for that for sure. So they impounded the plane. So I somehow, I get in touch with my, my people I'm meeting up in, um, in Auckland and let them know that I'm now delayed. So finally, I don't, hours and hours later, I get on a plane. I've meet, now been up longer. To this day, this is the longest I've ever been up in my life. So we finally get there. I get to Sydney, I get to Auckland and I get off the plane and I'm greeted by five people saying, happy birthday to you, <laughs> happy birthday to you. At which point I'm like, whoa. <laughs> but I'm a writer. And at the time I was uh, working on an ent uh, entry into the sitcom world. And at the time there was a show called Anything But Love On. And I don't know if you remember it. It starred Jamie Lee Curtis and Richard, Richard Lewis as a neurotic Jewish guy from New York. So I wrote a spec script where Richard Lewis is terrified of flying. But he finally, Jamie Curtis, Jamie Lee Curtis convinces him to get on a plane. He gets us on a plane and the guy next to him dies. 
And the flight crew says to him, well, we can't let the passengers know someone has died. We have to make it look like he's alive. So you have to talk to him. So he spends, so Jamie, so Richard Lewis spends, is on this flight. He's terrified to fly. And he's trying to have a conversation with the, cor the, the corpse sitting next to him. And of course, at some point, there's turbulence. And the guy falls over onto him. And he has to continue. And um, that's, that spec script got me into a, an advanced crime writing lab, uh, crime, advanced sitcom writing lab at UCLA and um, Extension. And that's where I met the, the gal who became my uh, TV writing partner. So I did get to use that experience. But actually, to this day, it's the longest I've ever been. I think it was up in total probably 48 hours. So... Well, that, that basically answers, it's supposed to be an urban legend that every 747 has a cabinet for a corpse. Right, that can't be the plan. Weekend at Bernie's cannot be the plan. <laughs> it was the plan. The man was laid out and with a, I still remember, it was a gray blanket and he's there That's like great. this, the gray blanket. And I'm like, oh my God, for eight hours, eight Eight hours. Well, before, I was before I was married, the, the person who became my wife, her name is Julie. Um, I, Allegedly. Uh, Allegedly. Never seen her. Yeah, well, you're not meant to. But uh, for, for Christmas, I said, let's have Christmas in Transylvania. Um, <laughs> so uh, we, we flew out on like one of these package ski tour things, and you basically go to Romania, and it's in, in Transylvania, and it was the bizarrest thing. We had, um, you arrive like Christmas Eve, and they do a seven hour Christmas Eve dinner. You turn up at 7 p.m. and it was just kind of this endurance thing. There's like right. entertainment and stuff and what have you. But this, it kind of kicked off the theme for the week because some guy at our table said, I don't feel too good. I'm just going to go upstairs because this thing is like, it's just what this thing's never going to end. He went up and died in his room. Um, a young couple who were on their um, what you call honeymoon, their room was broken into. They were robbed and, and beaten up. Oh, the, the wife got hit in the face by a chairlift and broke her nose. And we had this guy who was um, very um, irritating. He just had he just had this thing of he could handle any. He was kind of like the international man of mystery amongst like forty people on this thing, and everybody after a week can stand it. He got hit by um, uh, a ski do thing and got his leg broken. Gotcha. But the thing at the end of the week was the bus trip back with a you know a grieving family, people who had been beaten up and mugged, people with various broken bones. It was the fun week I've ever had. Did but you feel anyway. guilty? Because nothing had happened to you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it, it, it literally, there was, there was just this bus was filled with people who had some calamity. And it was just us and another couple who kind of went, we got away with it for a while. Because I usually, I usually well, have trouble with everything and track that's trouble. Hilarious. Well, I have to say that the, the approach worked because I, I met people like after when we landed, I was telling people, oh my God, you, did you know what happened? And they were like, no, we had no idea. So while people are sleeping peacefully, I'm like, you know, more comforting, sobbing Italians um, and walking by a, a, the late, their late grandfather. So, but it worked for the airline. Yeah, but I, I yeah, I've always wondered because there's supposed to be the urban legend as a cabinet. You know, if there was, there wasn't. This was Continental, and they had just opened up this route, which is why I got a cheap flight. They had and that's why the they don't exist anymore. No, yeah, maybe <laughs> maybe it was the second death. Maybe that was the second corpse. There you go. That's, that's, that's right. That's right. Yeah. That, that space is already filled. That's right. That's, that's, right. that's what's yeah. going to be written yeah. in the chat. That's exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. That's right. But the, the, I should have told the story about when my, my father-in-law di died, and... The, he, this was in an uh, apartment building and the own, and they only had like a tiny little elevator and so when we had to move the body um we actually had to stand him up with the sheet over him <laughs> and it was like a four person one so you're all like that and we had to stand him up oh, there's dear. a lot more to that story but that's for another <laughs> save time save it save it for another time but um with that is all our stories we have about 10 minutes for questions um so if you have questions start putting them in the chat thing and um and i can i can hey, read them out so and we can many. see if there's anything we may have we may have a lot of radio silence after those five stories 
<laughs> oh, this is an okay. interesting question. It says, what's the strangest thing we would find in your Google history? God, there are so many strange things. I'm sure I'm on some like FBI. I, you know what? Watch. I'm going to throw, I, this is not a Google history, but I have to tell you something that just happened to me literally last night. So um, I got really mad at Alamo Car Rental. We're going to New Orleans. I'm trying to get a car rental. And they sent me one of these ads that were like, great rate. So I go and click on it. And then I find out there are no cars available at that rate um, for the insiders. So I go back as a non-insider and I find there are plenty of cars available, but <laughs> <laughs> so I really, so I don't let things like that go. So I, so I write to them and they say, oh, okay, you can call this number. So I call this number and I get some medic alert thing. And I'm like, that's not the right number. Okay, we'll call this number. So last night I call this number and it's like, hi, hi, hot guys, hot ladies here waiting to take your call. Hey, so I'm like, Alamo car rental. What the what is this? So I emailed them again. They say, oh yeah. And I'm like, okay, you, you lied to me. You did a bait and switch on the right. Now you're, you know, now you're sending me, you send me to a medical alert site. Now you send me to a porn line. You know, and I pretended to be, a, you know, I could care less, but I said, I'm offended. You've offended me. You know, I need some recompense. And they said, well, here's the right number to call. That's all they got back to me. So that's, uh, it's not my Google history, but I ended right. up, you know, on a hot guy line because of there we go. stupid Alamo. Yeah, I hope I've erased all my Google history, but apparently it goes somewhere, right? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. always somewhere. It, it never disappears. It never disappears, yeah. yeah. Um, I was going to say, give me a letter and I'll just, I'll just put it in Google and tell you what comes up. <laughs> right now because you know there's one good thing about being virtual give us a letter of the alphabet s thank you <laughs> right a couple of minutes oh this is so innocent small store edinburgh shut department store there you go that's, that's nice that's got such an innocent life yeah. oh i know this isn't a google one but i must admit i was um I was in sort of like the grocery outlet and they had some uh, luggage and I thought, yeah, you can get a body in that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, well, I'm assuming we've all got the same, like how do you yeah. tie a hangman's noose? What's the uh, fatal dose of any number of uh, drugs? You know? I put S in and got strychnine. I know that, oh, I, yeah. I know that I've basically gone into Pretty like um, Home Depot and come out with like lots of plastic, bleach, duct tape, <laughs> shovel, that kind of thing. And, but, the, you know, none of them are connected, but you do get a sideways look. Yeah. I love about conferences is uh, when we all gather down at the bar after, you know, the panel work is all done and we're sitting around talking about various ways to, if, to off people. Right. And people who aren't a part of the conference I love how they look at us all. Yeah. Right. Oh God, yeah. Like the, uh, I had to learn to say, I write murder mysteries and, and then say the thing I was going to ask. You don't just ask. <laughs> it's it. a dental hygienist you've never met. If you find a severed head, can you tell what yeah. whether the person's left or right-handed because of wear and tear on the gums from the brushing? Uh -huh. But you know what's look, worse? What? When those people look at you and go, I've got a story for you. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, uh -huh. yeah. Mm. <laughs> so I'm not I sure I want to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> you can, by the way, the dental hygienist thinks you can. If someone's a vigorous flosser, you should be able to tell whether oh. a severed head is left or right-handed. You okay. know what? My dental hygienist said that. She goes, I can tell. She goes, this would be good. Everyone has something for your mysteries. That I can tell whether someone is left or right-handed by um, how much uh, plaque is on a particular tooth. Interesting. Uh, because yeah. their, their dominant hand, their non-dominant hand, right. they, she can yeah. tell that's a non-dominant hand. I think okay, everyone who heard that, that's mine. I like that. I'll collect people. Which is you? You'll be in the bar, and someone will tell you what they do as a job, and you'll go, "Oh, I wouldn't yeah. even ask you." Is <laughs> if this was a body, or you know, and they they get right. a bit worried then. Yes, it. I saw that. That was just yesterday. I can't remember what was I watching yesterday. When so, oh, I know what it was. It was pointless. A quiz show with Richard Osman, who also writes crime fiction, and one of the people on the quiz show said her job, and he went, "That's an interesting job." And I said to Neil on the couch. <laughs> He's he's filed that. That is the that is the voice of a crime writer who's yeah. just heard a good job. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like, huh? Yeah. 
Just trying to see if we've got any other questions. I must admit with this thing, if we if we were doing this live, I would have told a completely different story, but that some stories um, can't go over the internet. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, okay, okay, let me see what I've got here. I've got some messages coming through. Oh, Katrina, did you return the bras? Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> I took two of them back. You've um, taken all three back. <laughs> uh, well, you know, no, because it's quite a nerve-wracking night. <laughs> um, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I know. Nice. Um, and she was, and she wasn't on shift, so I didn't have to say sorry for her. I didn't have to say sorry to her. As just, a native, as a native New Yorker, I have to say I'm offended by her behavior. I <laughs> no, I don't know. Why. Maybe I her just, first day. It was maybe her first and last day. We are not and allowed it's closed to be slow. down. No. So years later, when Lord and Taylor closed down, I thought, well, I'm not surprised. Mm. <laughs> I worked there. Oh my gosh! I one of my first jobs out of college. I worked in their um, uh, in their uh, personal shopping department. I got to meet Lillian Heldman and the wives of many uh, sin, since deposed dictators in um, in South and Central America who would come in and shop just barrels and barrels wow. and then i would read like so and so oh de guzman was recently deposed as right. and, and you oh, know great. and sent to exile and I'm, i wonder if the wife brought the clothes with her yeah that's a great bit <laughs> yeah i i am um, i have a friend who did a photo shoot for a magazine um and she was, did like a interior thing and it was on the cover and uh, all the clothes she wore and she thought oh i'll probably get to keep these for the the shoot they had all the the shop tags in and when the shoot was over, she had to give them back because they were returning it all back to the store. Mm. Well, you know what? This is, I remember this now that there was an actress whose name I can't, I would say it right now. Um, I can't <laughs> blame okay. well. They but hated it, her because she would uh, wear stuff and then insist on returning it, even like it would have stains and blah, blah, mm. blah. And it was like, and, and then her major domo or someone ended up writing a, a kind of a tell all about her. <laughs> And I read the book going, oh, yes, I remember the stories I used to hear. <laughs> right. I was going to say, I will put, I'm going to put a picture of me in that bubblegum pink dress up on Twitter after this. And you look at how shiny and melted I am. You will understand why I couldn't return anything I had on. <laughs> oh, that'd be great. Um, love to we've, see we've only got a couple of minutes left. I have one last question I did see pop up on here. And it said, "When? what's everybody's next book? Oh, oh yeah. And when? So anybody I, want prepared, to I prepared for this. <laughs> there you go. 10th yeah, of November. Yeah. This is ne good. like a couple of weeks' time. 10th of November. Uh, hey, wait. Look at this. Oh. It's coming out just after the election and it is called The Turning Tide. Right on. From there. my jacket to God's ears. That's, That's it. That's it. That's right. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, actually, mine is coming out the week after uh, uh, Matthew Henson and the Ice Temple of Harlem. I think it drops November 17th. It was going to originally drop in July, but because of COVID, etc. It's yeah. now then. And uh, this uh, Long Island ice, and I said that like a Long Islander, a uh, Long Island iced tea <laughs> comes out uh, in the end of February uh, 2021 as Maria DeRico. And um, I just recently turned in the manuscript for number 18 in my Cork O'Connor series, a novel mm -hmm. called Lightning Strike. Uh, and it's scheduled for publication in August of 2021. Awesome. Um, my next thing is called Doubt in Thomas, and that's going to be out next year. Yeah. I'm not quite sure when, though. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of it yeah, about, right? right? Yeah. yeah. There's a lot um, of it. it was supposed to be then, and now it's, you know... It's well, yeah, I mean, everything's been shoved around, yeah. I don't know. Right, right. Um, we've got two minutes left. Um, I hope people like this. Um, supposedly one day this may, I've been asked to convert this into a radio show or a podcast. Um, someone approached me to do this, so I may be looking for authors to come and tell their stories uh, right. on radio. Oh, yeah. Um, I think that's about it, unless anybody wanted anything to add. <gasps> Here's Holly. Hey! <laughs> Lightning quick story, Holly. Uh... Once we used to live in the same building as Jackson Brown and there was mysterious human urine in the elevator once. I probably shouldn't say people's names, huh? <laughs> oh, my God. oh, it's too late now. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We're, wait, wait. Convinced, we're convinced it was his nephew who is living with him. Ah, right. There um, you go. There but you go. it was kind of a weird thing because 
he was out Jackson was outraged by this urine. <laughs> we were like, um, I, I'm pretty sure it was your nephew. <laughs> anyway, that's all between all of us. That's, that's it. it. No okay. further than this room. Exactly. Okay. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Let's that's see. Cool. There's 162 people in this room. That's it. Well, you know. Oh. Yeah, yeah. That's no problem. People know how to keep secrets. Yeah, you. That's but right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, Simon, this, this panel strikes me as sort of the mystery f- community's answer to the Moth Radio Hour. Oh. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, no, to be honest, this all came out about four or four, five years ago from the bar stories. You going back to your, what you mentioned was all the stories that um, everybody kind of tells in the bar but doesn't tell on the panels yes and, it's, and yeah. i thought well let's bring some of the bar stories out yeah there you go all right guys that was a great panel well thank you thanks thank for having you us. so thank much you Simon. Great. thank you thanks, thanks, everyone. Nice, everyone. Nice, great to see everyone yeah here, same here. all right take care bye, bye.